I think history is important because when you go back to the world of the painters, and by the way, the paintings of these portraitists from three or four hundred years ago, the uh, you know the Rembrandts, and even even later on up closer to us, and this may be only only a century old, the sergeants and so forth, um, they were extremely important because they did something specific. They in practically all cases they captured they captured a slice of life of of what was happening. Uh, even even the posed portraits like the Mona Lisa. Uh, and, 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 and many of those type portraits, they captured something about that where you could really tell something about this person. And um, I, I think that's important for, for us to remember. We have a, a historical precedent that we can, if we could study what was done before, then it should help us on our pathway to where, we're, where we want to be headed. And, uh, uh, I like to say, you know, we inherited this profession from the painters 100 or 200 years ago, and once in a while, we photographers need to stop and just think about it a moment. What have we done with that profession that we inherited? There's nothing like understanding your craft, and there's nothing to do that like understanding where you came from and how the medium you're working in came to be and how it works. Don't underestimate the power of learning from history. Now, around 1553, Giovanni Battista della Porta was known to have first used the camera obscura as a drawing aid. And the camera obscura is kind of where photographics was born from. We had this box, it had a lens, and you would focus it on an object, and then you would use that to project an image onto a surface so that you could draw it out, so that you could trace it and, and get unprecedented levels of detail. The way minds work, smart people and scientists, they wanted to do more with that. They wanted to carry that further and they had a way to project this image. What if there was a way that we could preserve this image? What if instead of drawing the image, an image could be projected and then captured permanently? Now we don't know the date exactly, but shortly before 1800, Thomas Wedgwood, was one of the first people we know of that tried to take an image using this concept and make it permanent. Thomas was the son of Josiah Wedgwood, the famous potter, and he had some success in actually capturing an image, but he wasn't able to make the image latent in light. So he would, he would get an image of some kind, and then when it was put out in the light, it would get destroyed because the image wasn't fixed like we do in, in, in the darkroom. And this was still a significant point though. This was a point when they were taking from the concept of the camera obscura and then combining that with the concept of making a permanent image into a surface similar to as we would with an etching or an engraving, but using means of chemicals and light. And this was the beginning of something truly amazing. Now Wedgwood was friends with the chemist Humphrey Davy and Humphrey Davy saw what he was doing and he realized the significance of this and basically said, if, if this could be made stable, if you could make this image latent and stable in light, we'd be onto something huge. And he was absolutely right. And while it would be a, some years before that happened, the significance of where they were going with this was astounding. Around 1827, Joseph Niepce made the first permanent photograph. Now these first photographs were made on a polished pewter plate using a petroleum derivative called bitumen of Judea. And they were rudimentary, it was basics, but we had an image. We had an image that was latent in light that could be recorded. In the next few years, Niepce partnered up with Louis Daguerre and they started working together on this process to try and refine it. Now in 1833, Niepce died and he left the work to Daguerre and Daguerre continued working on refining the process. He started using some different chemical combinations and he made the image better as things went along. Now in 1839, Daguerre announced the, the finished process that he had worked out and called it the Daguerreotype. He took it to the Royal Academy in London and it was almost a miracle. I mean, they, this, this was a big deal. We have to understand that, that here for all of history, 
we had paintings, we had drawings, you know, we had etchings, those kind of things. And suddenly we have an instrument that will record an image, it will record what we see permanently, exactly as it was out there. And it's important to step back. I mean, imagine being in the Royal Academy on that day. And, and it was a big deal. This was a major step forward. This was a shifting point for history. Now, almost immediately after this, the French government bought Daguerre's patent and made the Daguerreotype public domain. And then they gave him a stipend of 6,000 francs a year for this. With one exception, days before all this happened, Daguerre's attorney had filed a patent for the daguerreotype in England. So England was uniquely denied this, this process that was free to the rest of the world. And because of that, the daguerreotype didn't take off near as well there because there was licensing fees associated with it. But essentially, for most of the world anyhow, the daguerreotype, you didn't have to pay a royalty or a licensing fee. The French government bought it. They made it public domain. They saw the value and the significance of this and anyone could use it. And this, this was huge. This opened a door to something that had never been touched before. And it was the beginning of something that would alter the course of the way we record history, of the way we remember things. Around this same time, Henry Fox Talbot developed a similar process that was actually more refined in some ways, and it used a chemical process that he picked up from John Herschel. And that used hyposulfate of soda, which we know as hypo, to dissolve the silver salts. And with the daguerreotype, I mean, you were dealing with a wet plate. You had to set it up, you had to deal with all this. Wherever you were, it was, it was a fairly complex system. Talbot's system was in many ways better because it was more manageable, it was easier to use. It had kind of a paper material that would be used. And the downside was in that. There was a lack of detail. Even though it was easier to handle, it was easier to, to work with, the way that the material was used, it, it caused a lack of detail. And because of that, it, it didn't take over the scene. It was relevant, but it, it didn't dominate the daguerreotype. Now, it's worth considering that with the daguerreotype, the, the process was slow and arduous. You sat there, you waited for the image to appear on the plate. The calotype was more like we think of the modern negative. The calotype, you could make the image and then you could develop it later. The fact that it was on this paper, it was kind of blur-inducing. So it didn't have the detail and that was its, its main trade-off. And it wasn't until 1851 that we saw the glass wet plate come in. And this is when we really started to get into the negative. In 1851, the collodion wet plate process was invented by Frederick Scott Archer. And this actually used a glass negative that eliminated the concerns you had with the calotype with the loss of detail. But it also gave you a negative that you could then reproduce prints from. So this was a fairly fundamental shift. The daguerreotype wasn't original. You made a daguerreotype and that was your daguerreotype. And of course you could photograph another daguerreotype and make copies of it, but you didn't have a negative like we think of now where you could make prints. So the daguerreotype and the calotype, these, these were originals. You know, you'd make an image and you could, you could then photograph the image and make a copy that way. There was processes that they would use metal plates and basically make an engraving from the photograph to use in newspapers. There were techniques, but in 1851, when the glass negative came out, that was significant because now you had this master that you could make prints from. And it may have been cumbersome and it may have had its restrictions, but at the same time, the potential it offered was huge. You know, we even read about Ansel Adams and he talks about carrying his eight by 10 glass negatives up into the hills. And, you know, that sounds pretty crazy to have to pack sheets of glass around just to make photos. but. For me, as a large format photographer, while I'm certainly not having to deal with glass negatives, I'm, I'm using modern negatives, there's still a little bit of that feel. You gotta pack these big negatives around and you gotta have all your gear and set it up and you load it up and you make the frame. There's an element of history in that that I found to be really valuable to my understanding of light, to my slowing down and kind of thinking and considering and visualizing better. This process 
that we've been through in photographic history. We can see as we go along here how there's these steps that have taken us from one to the other, starting with very rudimentary images, but quickly moving forward. These were scientists that were refining a process, a process that up till a few years ago, relative to history, didn't exist. Now, the, the glass wet plate, this gave rise to portable dark rooms and these kind of trailers that would go around and, and they would make portraits. This is really significant because previously, Portraits were something that were a fairly major ordeal. Generally, they were for the more wealthy. And, you know, you had to do a commission and you had to do a sitting and all this stuff. And, and suddenly we have these people with their portable studios roaming around the countryside making images. Now, let's not underestimate how much work this still was. This was not a Polaroid. We still had glass wet plates. And a wet plate meaning it wasn't like you just pulled it out and stuck it in and made an image and then put it away and developed it later. You actually had to deal with wet chemicals. You had to prepare the plate to make it light sensitive. So there was a process to this that was fairly involved. Then in 1871, Dr. Richard L. Maddox invented the dry plate which is the same principle, but it was dry. You didn't have to prepare the chemicals and put them on them in the field. You could carry your film or glass plate, as it were in this case, with you. And this, this greatly simplified the process. And when we read about like Ansel Adams hiking into the hills, this is what he would have been carrying was dry plates, eight by 10, five by seven, four by five dry plates. And the introduction of the dry plate, if you think about how much simpler that would make it, imagine everywhere you went, you go out and you make a landscape like this, and you have to prepare chemicals, you have to mix chemicals, you've got this wet piece of glass that you're having to prepare to make an image on. So the significance of the dry plate, while we kind of brush over it in the course of history, was very, very significant. It's important to remember that none of this was very long ago, relative to history. I mean, think how long We've been going with paintings and drawings and all that kind of thing. And here, just a few hundred years ago, less than that, we have the ability to make a photograph, to make an image that's latent and light. This is something to get excited about. This is something to study and to think about and to appreciate how amazing it is that we can, we can pull out a phone. And I'm not advocating phone photos for everything by any means. But the fact that we can make these images, this was all born from these guys, from Neeps, from Daguerre, from Maddox, from these people that understood the science and they worked on this until they found a way that we could make an image. And it's gotten easier now to click, click, click and make images. But the science behind it is still essentially the same and of course, the artistry behind making it really, really amazing has not really changed. Now, in the late 1800s, George Eastman invented film. And this is, this is like the film essentially as we know it today, the negative on a piece of plastic that's portable and mobile. Uh, he patented roll film in 1884. George Eastman released his first camera in 1888 and it made a circular image. And then in 1892, he founded Kodak. And the rest is history. Kodak was huge to the world of photography for over a century, really. So the daguerreotype, the calotype, these early photographic processes, they brought the ability for everyone to have a portrait of their loved ones, to have an image that was, that was real, that conveyed who they were and what they looked like. And that was a huge shift. It brought the ability to capture something as it was. As we come into the turn of the century, this is a shift of fundamental proportions. Photography was very expensive up till this point. It wasn't something that everybody just ran around and they had a camera. It was something for the wealthy. It was for something as a business. And in 1900, Kodak released the Brownie Number no. 1. The Brownie Number no. 1 cost $1. Now, $1 was a lot more in 1900 than it is now, but this was an attainable piece of equipment. Anybody now could make a photo. And the ability to put photography in the hands of the masses, this, this scared the professionals at the time. The brownie was even Ansel Adams' first camera. In 1916, his aunt gave him a brownie and, and that's, that's how he started. Now, what about color? All this was black and white up to this point. And 
Up to the 1890s, color was considered a pipe dream. It was considered something talked about by madmen and swindlers. It was not feasible to make a color image in, in the minds of people who understood photography. But they were wrong. Now, in fact, there were color images made before this. As early as the 1870s, there were color images made using complex processes, but they did have color. It wasn't the vivid, vibrant color that we think of today, but they were capturing color images. But it wasn't until the 1930s that color really became accessible, that it really became something that was practically achievable, and that was with Kodachrome. From 1935 to 2009, Kodachrome was the film. It's legendary in the photographic world for its beautiful color. The way it rendered colors and tones is absolutely stunning. As somebody who works with digital, I still use digital techniques to try and mimic the look that Kodachrome gave us. But Kodachrome wasn't just about the fact that the color was good. It was about the fact that color was now attainable. You go back to the 1940s and you look at Kodachrome images from around World War II in a time where you're not used to seeing color images. It's important to note that, yes, there was color, but that doesn't mean everybody was using color. It was more expensive, the films were slow, there were limitations, especially in the early Kodachrome. But to go back in history to a time where almost everything is black and white and see color, it's almost shocking. And the Kodachrome images from the early eras they're still beautiful, they're radiant, the color is stunning. Kodachrome was a legend in color. So the first viable digital cameras started coming around 1990. And the first camera that was commercially available, the first digital SLR, was still big and cumbersome and kind of had these different components and it was nothing like we think of DSLRs today, but it was a digital camera. It had 1.3 megapixels and it cost $13,000. That was the beginning of another fundamental shift in the way we make images. But once again, the science, the foundations of light, the artistry hasn't really changed. Digital has brought us into a world where we kind of rush around and we make a lot of images and sometimes we just click, click, click away and don't really produce much of anything. So in some ways, personally, I feel like digital has not always been a positive. Digital has done a lot for photography, but it's also changed our perception of how we value the photograph, of how we make the photograph, of how much time we put into the photograph because the expense is so low with a digital camera. There's no turning back history. We have digital cameras. And whether you love them or whether you hate them is not really relevant to the historical fact that they're here and they do what they do. I still love using film. I also love using digital. I, I work with both together. I try and merge those in the most productive way possible. History can teach us a lot about photography. It can tell us where we came from. It can also remind us to slow down and take the time and to appreciate the science and the foundations and to understand the masters and what they put in to making photographics what it is today. And if we take our time and understand history I think it's going to make us all slow down a little more. I think it's going to make us all make images that are a little better, regardless of the medium we make them on. The history of photographics is not over. Digital is still a baby compared to film. We have cameras from the early 1900s that have more detail and resolution than we produce in most digital SLRs today, by a long shot. That's one of the reasons that I still use film is because the detail and the resolution is so high. Digital's still moving forward, but it's not the do all end all yet. It hasn't replaced everything that film did for us. It's new. And when you look at the scope of history and where photographics have come from and what they've been through, we realize how new digital really is. Where's the history going? What's coming next? We don't know, but it's going to be an interesting road and it's certainly not over.